are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a slightly later than usual Friday Reads. It's been a day. So I'm filming this starting at 9.30 at night on Friday. It's usually been posted for several hours by now, but better late than never. So, lots to tell you. I have no adjectives for the kind of reading week it's been. Maybe I will supply one by the end of the video. I have finished four books. So we'll start out, unfortunately, with the most disappointing of the entire video, and that was this royal biography of Princess Mary Adelaide, Queen Mary's mother, the People's Princess by S.W. Jackman, was crap! Oh, it was so disappointing. I mean, uh, to be fair to it, he, in a very matter-of-fact way, educated me on stuff about her background and her genealogy and all her relations and the history of the, the German branch of the, the British royal family that was indeed interesting, and I got a lot out of it. But he completely, completely botched the life of this fascinating woman. She's one of the most fascinating members of the British royal family in 200 years, and he made her boring and banal. If I made a separate review, maybe two people would watch it, and Mr. Worthington would be one of them, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, if I did, I would sit down and read you a paragraph from James Pope Hennessy's biography of Queen Mary, or some of the uh, many other royal biographies, Queen, Queen Victoria, or whatever, that captured her bouncy, larger-than-life, excuse the pun, she was a very large woman, tempestuous, selfish, yet on other levels completely selfless and kind personality, and this biography just writes with all the candor and insight and vulnerability of a fucking Christmas card letter. You know the ones that your mum writes and sends out every year? I mean, how much uh, truth do you get about anybody? And that was the tone. She's always receiving gifts or visiting people, and she was very happy to have received the letter. Or the family very much enjoyed having tea with blah, blah, blah. It doesn't go any deeper than that. Again, you have to be pretty n nerdy in a royal way to even for this to even register. But, you know, she was the Queen's cousin, Queen Victoria's cousin, and... Prince Albert dies, and this book doesn't even mention his death. I mean, it was just stupid stuff like that that it was just... Yet, you know, every time they traveled over to Europe, how seasick did they get, and how long did it take them to recover? It was like just the most banal details and ignoring the real color of her life. I mean, it, it's quite a feat to write a boring book about Princess Mary Adelaide, I have to say. and But then just infuriating because she mentions that a lady-in-waiting of her mother's that was also her lady-of-waiting when she was younger detested her and he did have access to this lady-in-waiting's journals and she only he only quoted from it twice and referred to her like three times in the whole book like there would have been so much juicy gossip in there and he doesn't give us any of it like i don't know what he was trying to do but this was a big snooze fest so disappointing. I think I gave it two stars. Maybe if I was generous because of all this background information that I appreciated, three stars, but it was terrible. Uh, in happier news, I have finished the memoir by Amru al Kadi, Unicorn, the Memoir of a Muslim Drag Queen. I will be doing a separate review, so all I'm going to say is it was a four star read. I struggled because I don't get along with the memoir genre. But I got through my struggle, and they, al Qadi identifies as gender non-binary, so I'm using the, the appropriate pronoun. They really told a powerful story, in spite of some of the things that I didn't like because of my prejudices against the genre. I will do a full review of it, because it's worth your time. Saudad is a novella by Sunita Perez da Costa, which I finished yesterday, and I could only give it three stars because, now this is about a Goan Indian family living in Angola, and it's told through the eyes of, of the child narrator, and she doesn't reach teenagerhood until two-thirds of the way through the novel, and the, so the first two-thirds I thought was boring. Da Costa does have some literary talent, and she did make 
some of those scenes at least semi-vivid, but I don't like being stuck in a child narrator's head for so much of a novel that does actually go beyond that. Like, childhood is boring, usually, and it wasn't very interesting here, and I th thought the novella suffered from that, and just when it was starting to get good, it ended. Poof! There was enough evidence of literary talent here, and again, Sunita Perez da Costa is a Indian Angolan writer living in Australia. So she would be an Indian Angolan Australian writer, and this novella was written in English, and there was uh, it was good enough that I will definitely read the very next thing she publishes. But this one didn't really work for me. On a whim, I saw that there was a book of lesbian poetry on the Costa shortlist and it was available to me in audiobook format. So I took Adam's sage advice and I audiobooked it yesterday. I'd read, I'd listened to the whole thing. And it's called Flesh by Mary Jean Chan. She is a Asian British poet of Hong Kong descent. And her poetry, I quite enjoyed. I give it four stars. Uh, the most powerful poems were about her relationship with her mother, who was... I never did get the sense of whether she ever came around to completely accept her daughter's lesbianism, but certainly it was a big struggle and conflict in the relationship. And some of those poems, and also about the mother's life back in China, were incredibly powerful. She does a lot of stuff with bilingual, with Chinese mixed in with the English, and I wasn't so crazy about the romantic stuff, but I never usually am. But uh, for the most part, I, I would highly recommend this book of poetry, Flesh by Mary Jean. Oh, and also fencing. So she did fencing. So lesbian fencing is a thing maybe because the, she, her fencing poems were really good. Uh, yeah. And I think flesh was a word that was from fencing, but I may not be remembering correctly, but I do recommend this. So those are the four that I finished this week, and I have started, I've started two. This is a Buddy Reed with Juan of Bookish Islander. Deborah Levy's The Man Who Saw Everything, and this was long listed for the Booker. And I joked last week that because it didn't make it to the shortlist, it was probably the best of the whole bunch. And I am sorry to say that that was not correct. I am, I forget, 75% of the way through, maybe 80%. I'll finish it up tomorrow. I needed a break from it today. So I'm going to talk about my disappointment in this novel in a completely non-spoilery way. I'm not going to do a full review, so I'll have a little bit more commentary next Friday. But uh, it was brilliant. The only other thing I've read by Levy was uh, Hot Milk from a couple of years ago, and I loved it. This is a very different piece of literature. It opens with a, a hot bisexual man stepping off the road where the Abbey Road cover, Beatles cover, was photographed. He steps off the road in 1988 and he's hit by a car. And then all kinds of things happen. He goes to the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, and he falls in love with his German minder slash translator. And there's all this stuff and it is told in such a weird way that you kind of feel like the characters are, I don't know, talking underwater. I was hooked emotionally for, for, from the very beginning while being aware that there was a surrealness to the story, and that often doesn't work for me. But I carried through the first half. It's a 200-page novel. The second half starts out even weirder, and I was still engaged emotionally. And then, Juan and I agree on this. Other readers have would have another opinion, and I'm certainly not going to spoil it for anybody. But then... It, it's so much more surreal that it's like the literary textual equivalent of what's that artist that p paints the clocks that are that are all morphing on the side of the on in the picture they're all distorted oh my god you know who i mean it's like that in fictional form and it gets so weird and i'm i was still engaged and then it does this m complete 360 and introduces a completely melodramatic, very realistic plot twist that stuck out like a sore thumb and just ruined the novel for me. I'm not going to say what it is, but it just was so jarring that I, and I've now read maybe almost 10 chapters past that, and it's just, I'm not going to recover. It was such a fatal flaw. So I know that my friend March Payne in Australia, she wrote an non-spoilery review 
on Goodreads and she talked about something that I think she had the same problem as Juan and I have had. It was just ruined a fascinating novel. So too bad, you can't win them all. In much happier news, I am well into this middle brow novel from 1936 UK, Begin Again by Ursula Orange. It's from the furled middle brow imprint of Dean Street Press. And you may remember that I did uh, what some of my commenters said was an overly labored compare and contrast of the page 112 tag to the triad chapter tag. And this was one of the books I used. So I did a lot of previewing on this book because I didn't get along with another book that I tried from this imprint, this new imprint, and was beginning to wonder because I haven't had luck with any of the Persephone books I've read and thought maybe I'm just not a middle brow reader. Oh my... When I was in my early 20s, I was a unibrow reader, but that's another story for another day. But anyway, <laughs> I am so delighted to report that Leah, my buddy reader from Calgary, and I are both absolutely loving it. And we're far enough in, we're well over halfway through, that I don't expect that to change. This is the word that both Leah and I arrived at independently, was it's a charming story that has an emotional tug, a lot of entertainment value, and is extremely well written. I wouldn't go so, so far as to say it's literary, but it's well done and I'm loving it. And it's about a group of mid 20 year old women in the early to mid 1930s. And they are struggling with relationships, sex, independence from parents, living independently, working shit jobs. And it's told with a joyfulness, but also seriousness that you have, you know, you can sort of see sociologically that underneath that well, they're up against a lot. It wasn't easy to be a young woman in 1930s. And it's told here in a way that makes it, I'm sometimes feeling all touched by some of the, really, the dialogue is really good. So there's playfulness between the romantic partners and the way that sex is talked about using language that would be quite shocking for its time but still pretty bland for our time but I can relate to it and I can relate to living in an apartment and not having enough money to pay the rent and all the stuff that, that a lot of them are going through and it's just well done each character is unique uh, I, I just think it's a really good novel and there's also something interesting going on with women's stories in that one of the characters is a novelist She's a novelist wannabe, so we hear a lot about the novel she's writing. Everybody that reads it says, uh, nothing's happening here. There's nothing happening in this novel. And I'm thinking, that's a Sean book. <laughs> and an another one, she reads the romance stories in some periodical that they get free to the house or whatever. And then Ursula Orange is writing this story about women's lives. And Ursula Orange's own life was tragic. She was married, had kids. One of her daughters died the writer Gillian Tyndall, whose name was familiar to me before I found out anything about her mother. And Ursula Orange was uh, psychiatrically hospitalized and died at the age of 46 in 1955. But she wrote at least two more novels. And based on how much I'm enjoying this one, I want to read all those and find out a lot more about her. But this one is really working for me. So those are what I've started, and we are at the end of the month. I'm going to be carrying a lot of stuff into early December. I hope to finish up most of it in early December. But in the meantime, I have stuff that I'm going to be starting in, in the next week, too. So now it's time for me to tell you all about that. First, a couple buddy reads. This is one of my favorite uh, Canadian short story writers. She's not, I always say this, every time I talk about Audrey Thomas on my channel, I say she's not on the same level as Alice Munro and Mavis Gallant, but she is, you know, not much more than a rung or two down, and I really like her short stories. She is, as far as I know, still alive in her mid-80s, lives on Galliano Island, or one of the islands off somewhere, uh, on the Pacific coast of Canada. And I went to one of her readings... Is, is it dated here? Yeah, October 1990. And uh, she signed my copy of this collection, Two in the Bush and Other Stories. And I will be buddy reading this with my dear friend Lindy from Edmonton, starting, I think we're starting on Sunday, December 1st. I can't wait. One of my favorite novels of all time is J.L. Carr's A Month in the Country, which I believe won or was nominated for the Booker in the 80s. 
and I have read it twice and need to read it again pretty urgently because it's that good. So, I have always been curious about what his other fiction might be like. On my second reread, it was a massive buddy read, and one of those buddy readers was Heidi of My Reading Life, and we conspired to try out some of his other fiction. So, this week we will start with his debut novel, A Day in Summer. And it was published in the 60s, I think, 1964. I won't be surprised if it's not as good as a month in the country but i really would like to know more about his complete oeuvre so i will have more to say about this later now the fact that i'm buddy reading it with heidi <laughs> feels like fate has decreed that it must be terrible because we have bailed on so many of our buddy reads it's usually my fault but sometimes we i've shared the blame with her so here's hoping i have a few other buddy reads which none of the others will start this coming week. I like to keep my December pretty on schedule to just kind of follow my nose. So I have decided I would like to fit one tome, one big book in by the end of the year. And I considered a whole bunch and I've settled on Boy Swallows Universe by Trent Dalton. So I'm going to start that this week. And I hope I like it. If I don't, I will put it down and pick up another big tome. I think that December is going to be about bailing. When I look at the number of one, two, and three star reads that I have racked up in October and November. That is shameful. I need to be bailing earlier and oftener because once I realize a book is going to be less than four stars, I should just bail. And I have been for various reasons, you know, none of which I respect, like it's a buddy read or it's short enough or... Maybe it'll get better. I don't respect any of that. That's bullshit. So I'm going to be much more ruthless about bailing in December. So, Oh, and one more that I'm going to start this week. Because tell me if you have this feeling. I have this feeling with food and books. But food is not very important to me. So let's just focus on books. But I do have the same thing with food. So I'll give you the food thing in 10 seconds or less. If I go out and, and order a steak and it's not any good... It just bugs me and my whole body is like out of whack until I eat a good steak later. Like there's just something, I'm just out of balance. So am I the only one? <laughs> so I'm that way with books. The fact that I bailed on the Anthony Trollope in October, it's just left a bad taste in my mouth because I love Anthony Trollope. So I just feel out of whack literarily bibliomanically until I read and enjoy another trollop. I'm going to take a page from, I'm going to take a book from Ange of Beyond the Pages because she was reading a short trollop for Victober and she said it was really good. I think it's like 200 pages, which is really short for trollop. It is called Lady Anna. 210 pages, unscribbed, written in 1871, published in 1874. That's all I need to know. So, those four I will start. I think that's enough. It's now almost 10 p.m. I have to edit this sucker and get it up. I have to edit this sucker and get it online before I go to bed tonight. And before I finish my bottle of wine. So, wish me luck and I will talk to you later. Bye. Thanks for watching.